Dr. Hess, you have the helm and we are recording. All righty. Uh, for those of you that are just joining us, uh, welcome. Welcome to the Washington Academy of General Dentistry's Stay at Home, Stay Healthy CE series. I think we're in about our fifth or sixth webinar. Uh, we've got a good lineup next week of, I, I think, nine presentations. So there's lots of opportunity to get your CE fix uh, here uh, from the Washington Academy of General Dentistry. And all these CE events are free. Our speakers are donating their time. So thank you very much to our speakers. We'd also like to thank all our sponsors, uh, Comet USA, University of Washington School of Dentistry, Seattle King County Dental Society, Pierce County Dental Society, Snohomish County Dental Society, and our good friends at the Canadian Academy of Restorative Dentists and Prostodontics. Uh, appreciate everybody uh, forwarding the emails, Facebook posts, and helping us promote this series. So we are going to just go through uh, some of the housekeeping here. For those that are, of you that are AGD members, you do not need to record your CE credit with the AGD. We will do that for you. However, it could take up to four weeks for that to show up on your transcript due to delays. You will also be getting an email with um, a uh, CE credit that you can print out, and that will be coming in the next two or three days to the email that you registered with. So uh, be looking for that in your inbox. Please do not send us an email or a text or in the chat box asking when will you receive your CE credit. That will be coming down the road. It just, you need to give it a little bit of time. Uh, you're reminded to keep that record uh, for down the road just in case you need to resubmit. So um, we're coming up on about four minutes to uh, the start of the webinar. Um, again, you'll see all these great CE events that are coming up and uh, that uh, have been hosted and sponsored by everybody from Patterson to the University of Washington School of Dentistry, uh, AGD student chapter. So thank you to everybody that's put uh, work into creating these. Um, it's uh, a great lineup for the next three weeks. We have some uh, new names that you haven't seen yet uh, on these flyers that are clicking through. We've got uh, Dr. Michael Fling that has agreed to do a, a webinar for us, Dr. Michael Melkers, uh, Dr. Bob Margess, and uh, Dr. John Nasty. So you'll be seeing those flyers coming in your email. Uh, very shortly uh, in within the next uh, three, four days. So again, if you're just logging in, CE credits will be sent to you via the email you registered at over the next two or three days. AGD members, we will submit your credit hours uh, on your behalf, but it could take up to four weeks for those to occur or, uh, to appear on your AGD transcript. All right, it looks like we have 288 that are on the webinar right now. Uh, we've got over 800 signed up, so we'll just give a few minutes here. Already, uh, a reminder to all our AGD members, these 
continuing education webinars are being brought to you at no charge, free CE, just as a benefit of being a member of the Washington Academy of General Dentistry or the Academy of General Dentistry. These webinars are open to anyone that wants to attend. I know today we have some non-dentists attending our webinar. Welcome. Uh, appreciate you spending the time with us. Uh, I'm not too sure that you need dental CE, but uh, nonetheless, we'll send you CE credit uh, after the webinar. Those will appear in your email box in two to three days. Uh, for those of you that are AGD members, we will uh, submit those to the Academy of General Dentistry on your behalf. Um, starting this, uh, or the following Friday, the 17th, Dr. Alan Yassin will be doing a virtual Dental Implant Study Club every Friday from noon to 1.30 or 2, uh, depending on how discussion goes. And uh, we'll be continuing that series over the next three or four weeks. So if you're interested, please use the QR code uh, to get registered. And uh, each week there'll be a new QR code and registration to join Dr. Alan Yassin in that Dental Implant Study Club. Um, we've got a great lineup of speakers next week, including Judy K. Mastoff. Uh, we've got um, Jiyoung Kim. We've got Dr. Ralph Schuler, and the list goes on and on. You'll see those uh, clicking through here. In about two minutes, we'll get rolling with the introduction of Dr. Unger and uh, allow him to do his presentation. Today, please, if you have questions, type them in the Q&A. Do not put them in the chat, okay? And then from there, at the end of the lecture, we're going to moderate and uh, feed those questions to Dr. Unger and uh, maybe boil down some of the questions that have uh, a, a similar uh, thought behind them. Uh, Monday, uh, Dr. Steve Rasner, uh, very excited. Just talked to him this morning. Uh, he's going to be joining us to do a presentation uh, Monday. Uh, as I mentioned before, Judy Kay is uh, going to be doing a lecture for us as well. Okay, um, with that, I think we're pretty well ready to roll here. Uh, Dr. Unger, I'm just going to give you a brief introduction and then I'm going to stop sharing my screen. You can share your screen and we'll get rolling with today's uh, webinar. So, Dr. Peter Unger serves as a distinguished professor of anthropology and the director of the Environmental Dynamics PhD program at the University of Arkansas. He received his PhD in Anthropological Sciences from Stony Brook University and taught gross anatomy in the medical schools at John Hopkins and Duke before joining the University of Arkansas faculty in 1995. Unger is known primarily for his work reconstructing diets and environments from fossil teeth. He has spent thousands of hours observing wild apes and other primates in the forests of Latin America and Indo Indonesia studied fossils from Tyrannosaurids to Neanderthals and developed novel techniques for using surface analysis technologies to tease information about ecology and the evolution from tooth shape and patterns of wear. Unger has written and co-authored more than 200 scientific works on ecology and evolution for journals and books and other media, including Science, Nature, Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, Scientific America, and the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society. Unger's work has been featured in a recent TED-Ed video and documentaries on the Discovery Channel, the Science Channel, BBC Television, and others. I want you to please help me welcome uh, Dr. Peter Unger. It's indeed a, a treat to have you here today. And it's so exciting to have somebody that's uh, using a dental scanner in their work and can relate to what we do in dentistry. So Dr. Unger, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen here if I can. Oh, come on. Val, I may need you to stop my screen share. My mouse is misby. There we okay. go. I got it. Got it. Okay. Please share your screen. 
Okay, well, I'm going to share mine now. Um, let's see. Well, I hope everybody can see my screen. Um, Dr. Hess, are we good? Yep, we're good to go. Thank you very much, sir. Well, thank you so much for that kind introduction. I'd like to talk today a little bit about uh, the kind of research that my colleagues and I do on the evolution of human diet and the kind of dental evidence that we can use to say what we say and, and know what we know. Now, while this is a, a Washington Academy of General Dentistry sponsored webinar, this afternoon I'd like to celebrate teeth and the amazing job they've done for our ancestors rather than focusing on what goes wrong with them, why and how to fix it. So for those of you out there who are practicing dentists, I hope you'll take the opportunity to, to, to look and, and listen and, and maybe appreciate the amazing structures uh, that you uh, are fortunate enough to work on on a daily basis. Okay, well, why teeth? I don't know, there's just something about them, right? I and mean, whether you see them in picture books or natural history museums, we're drawn to them. Our reaction is, is visceral. So I don't know what it is about teeth. Perhaps, perhaps it has something to do with the fact that we've spent so much of our evolutionary history running away from them. But for whatever reason, they are very important to us. Just how important? Well, in a survey by the online dating service Match.com, teeth were chosen to be the most important asset on a prospective date. And that was by both men and women. So from an evolutionary perspective, if you want to know how important teeth are, you just need to go look at surveys like this. More to the point, teeth are amazing feats of engineering to be celebrated. Just think about it. Your teeth have to break without themselves being broken up to millions of times over the course of your lifetime. And they have to do it built from the very same raw materials as the foods that you're eating. Just think of the amazing feat of engineering. Think of what an inspired engineer nature is. Well, I care about teeth largely because of what they can teach us about our evolution. Consider the myriad types of mammalian molars, each seemingly so perfectly adapted to whatever diet a given species has evolved to eat. So for example, if you look at this, this bottom jaw, this is an antelope. It has flat teeth, with parallel ridges of enamel, perfect for milling and grinding tough grasses. Consider the lion in the middle with its sharp bladed teeth called carnassials, seemingly perfectly designed for slicing through tough meat and sinew. Or the hyena at the top here with its flat, blunt, thickly enamel teeth, again, seemingly perfectly evolved for crushing hard foods like bone. So teeth can tell us something about an animal's place in nature, something about its evolution. What about us? What can our teeth teach us about ourselves? And what can the teeth of our ancestors teach us about how we evolve? That's gonna be the subject of today's webinar. We'll begin the presentation with a brief discussion on how teeth work, and in particular, at least from an anthropological perspective or a paleontological perspective, how tooth shape can be related to diet. Then I'll go on to talk about how teeth are used. We'll take an ecological approach. We'll actually go into the forest and follow monkeys and apes around and see them using their teeth. And believe it or not, how teeth work and how they're used are not necessarily the same. I'll introduce food prints, which is another way of looking at teeth and how they relate to diet. The food print that I'm partial to is called dental microware. The microscopic scratches and pits that form on a tooth surface as a result of its use. Then we'll bring all the evidence together to talk a little bit about the diets of our early ancestors and what teeth can teach us about this. And finally, in the last couple of moments, we'll see whether there are any lessons to be learned for today by the study of our own distant ancestors' teeth as it pertains to their diets. All right, well, let's jump right in. 
The traditional model sees teeth as guides for chewing. This is how they work. According to uh, famous British paleontologist Karen Hiemi, teeth are an essentially passive element in the active masticatory apparatus. They're dependent on the movements of the mandible for their functional interactions. In other words, teeth are basically passive players in the active game of chewing, according to this model. So the shapes of the teeth are there to guide the jaw for whatever food you have evolved to eat. If you look at this, this bottom left tooth, this is a, a, an antelope or a, I think it's a, a, a sheep. It could be a deer. They're all about the same. It's called a selenodont molar. It's flat, the, the occlusal surface is flat, and it has these long parallel bands of enamel. The chewing movement is perpendicular to these bands of enamel for milling or grinding tough grasses. You can think of the, the kind of movement as what you would expect if you were using a washboard with the parallel ridges running perpendicular to your hand motions. The same is true of a rodent, the next tooth over. Only in this case, these bands of enamel run buccolingually, side to side and the jaw movement is posterior, posterior to anterior. They don't move their jaw side to side, they move them back to front. But it's the same phenomenon for milling tough vegetation. Horizontal movements. In contrast, if you look at this lion tooth, this carnassial, it's clearly designed for vertical movements, like a pair of scissors or a, a set of shears for slicing through tough vegetation. And the final tooth type here on the right is a primate tooth, perhaps a human tooth. It could be a pig tooth or a bear tooth also. This is a, a cusp that fits neatly into a basin for crushing and grinding action. Again, vertical movements. So the traditional model holds once again that teeth are basically guides for chewing. But there's another view. Peter Lucas has more recently argued that teeth are not so much guides but tools tools for fracture. He claims that we can best explain dental dietary adaptations by identifying different forms of food, generalizing about their behaviors under stress, and designing equipment that might operate efficiently to comminute or break them down. This is more of an engineering perspective that starts with food rather than teeth. So the basic idea here is that foods don't want to be eaten right? The, the plants or animals to which they belong, they want to avoid being eaten. So they will evolve defense mechanisms to protect themselves. Some defense mechanisms are designed to harden foods, and an engineer might consider that increasing the work required to start a crack through them. Other foods are designed or, or are protected by toughening agents, and an engineer would consider those agents that increase the work required to spread a crack. Now, if you start to think about it, if breaking food is about fracturing and fragmenting it, starting and spreading a crack, you wouldn't think that teeth are best designed to do this because teeth work by compression, right? And in order to start and spread a crack, you need tension, you need to pull it apart. How do teeth create tension through compression? The answer to that question in the solution that your teeth come up with for breaking whatever foods it is you're evolved to eat depends on how those foods defend themselves. We'll start with hard foods, right? Think of a walnut, right? A, a walnut is hard and brittle. When you crush that walnut, the crack actually begins perpendicular to the plane of crushing, to the direction of the force that you're applying because the the shell flexes, and where it flexes, that creates tension. The best tooth for breaking a food like this is one that minimizes the contact point because that's increasing the stress, which is force per unit area by decreasing the area, but at the same time protects the tooth itself because the cusp itself is sort of hemispherical or dome-shaped, and that tends to prevent the cusp from breaking. So this is the kind of tooth you want with a hard food. If on the other hand, you're consuming tough foods, again, foods 
that require work to spread the crack. A wedge works better. Think about an ax splitting a, a log, right? As you push that wedge in, you're creating tension at the point of the advancing tip. And that basically pulls the materials apart and spreads the crack. The best tooth in this case would be bladed or a loaf. And reciprocal blades, opposing blades are best because that allows you to spread the crack from both directions at the same time. Okay, that's the theory. But what about real life? Do teeth follow these general rules that we would expect? Let's take a look. Here are three closely related old world monkey species that have somewhat different diets. The one on the bottom eats a lot of leaves. It's a silvery langur. The one on the top eats more hard objects. It is a mangabe monkey. And the one in the middle eats soft fruits. It is a macaque monkey. Eats a lot of other stuff too, but soft fruits is its preferred food. If you look at the teeth, and these are similarly worn, you can see immediately that there are some differences in the shapes of these molars. The leaf eater has long shearing blades, as you would expect for shearing and slicing tough leaves. The hard object feeder has much blunter teeth, as you would expect for crushing hard nuts. And the soft fruit eater is intermediate between the two. So we should be able to use the shapes of the teeth to say something about the diet of the species. We construct the diets of fossil species based on the shapes of their teeth. In order to do that, though, we need to be able to put numbers on this anatomy, say the crest length, assign numbers to the living animals, and compare those to fossils. The traditional way of doing this was actually developed by my own postdoc advisor, Rich Kay. He developed what's called shearing quotient analysis. And it's actually fairly simple, but very elegant. All you really need to do is you measure the lengths of the crests front to back, sum them up, and measure that relative to the length of the tooth. The relatively longer the crests, the steeper the slopes of the cusps, and presumably the better you would be at shearing rather than crushing. So what Rich did was he took a whole bunch of species of old world monkeys that eat fruits and plotted them on a graph, shearing crest length over molar length and found that there's a pretty tight relationship, a pretty tight line. And what this line is, this regression line is, is the expected shearing crest length for a molar of a given length, for a fruit eating monkey. Well, this is all very exciting, but it gets really exciting when we pop animals with different diets onto this graph. Here are leaf eating old world monkeys. And as you can see, their molar lengths or their shearing crest lengths are longer for a given molar length consistently than predicted for a fruit eating old world monkey. Leaf eaters have longer shearing crests. You should just be able to take fossils, pop them on these graphs, and say something about their diets using this simple technique. And it works really well and it stood the test of time. But I started to realize pretty early on in my postdoc time there that conventional shearing crests have their limits. It's really difficult to measure shearing crests on teeth that are worn down. And as any dentist can tell you, teeth wear from the outset. Basically, the landmarks we use to measure the crest length, they wear away, they disappear. It's a moving target. And because of this, it becomes increasingly difficult to get a good measure of shearing crest length. Not just that, but teeth are very complex three-dimensional objects. And there has to be more than just shearing crest length to the functional aspects of crown shape. And so as soon as I got my job at the University of Arkansas, I started to work on a solution to this problem of measuring worn teeth and the problem of getting a, a, a more comprehensive, holistic view of tooth form. And I happened upon something called geographic information systems. Geographic information systems is basically an approach 
to relating different types of data that are connected by geographic location in space. The classic approach or classic use for geographic information systems would be something like this. Here's an example. Let's say you're a farmer and you want to know where to plant your crops. What you might do is you might take a layer of information on soil type, a layer of information on hydrology, on, on water flow, a layer of information on uh, topography, landscape relief. Superimpose all these layers one on top of one another and look for the right combination to have the best crop yield. That's the power of GIS. One thing that GIS is very good at, especially, is measuring landscapes, right? And so I developed something called dental topographic analysis that allows you to treat teeth as landscape surfaces. I got myself a laser scanner, generated a 3D model of teeth, and plotted those teeth as landscapes. The cusps became mountains. The fissures became valleys. And we were able to use all the tools available in GIS, my students and I, to characterize functional aspects of tooth form without worrying about individual landmarks. So for example, we could look at the average slope across the occlusal surface. We could look at angularity or jaggedness of the surface, which for those of you who are um, mathematically inclined is the second derivative of elevation, the average slope of the slope. We could look at relief of the surface, the ratio of three-dimensional area to the projected or planimetric two-dimensional area underlying it. And since I developed these basic attributes, others have added more. For example, some look at orientation patch count, which is the number of contiguous parts of the crown that share a common orientation. The more patches, the more tools, as it were, for processing foods. Others have looked to an engineering standard called Dirichlet normal energy, which is a measure of the curvature of the crown. And so in aggregate, all of these attributes together should be able to tell us something of value about the functional aspects of tooth shape. The first study that I did with one of my students was looking very basically at gorillas, orangutans, and chimpanzees, the three great apes. Gorillas tend to eat more leaves, chimps tend to eat more fruits, and orangutans are intermediate in the ratio of fruit to leaf eating. The shapes of their teeth differ from one another. So I plotted average surface slope and average relief for each of these different species with individuals at different stages of wear. Very little wear, moderate wear, heavy wear. And what I found was really interesting. First of all, teeth get flatter as they wear down. This is not rocket science, it's basically anthropology. Teeth get flat as they wear. But more importantly, at a given wear stage, the leaf eater tends to have more sloping surfaces with more relief than the fruit eater. And the species with an intermediate diet is intermediate in its occlusal slope and relief. And more importantly even than this perhaps, is the fact that this relationship between diet and tooth wear, or tooth uh, slope and relief, holds whether you're looking at unworn teeth, moderately worn teeth, or heavily worn teeth. So as long as you can control for tooth wear, you can say something about diet and fossil species. Now, I became especially interested in, in the relationship between tooth wear and tooth function and partnered up with some colleagues from then at the time, uh, Johns Hopkins University, Mark Tiford, and Duke University, Ken Glander. They'd been going down to Costa Rica for decades and darting howling monkeys repeatedly and taking dental impressions using standard polyvinyl siloxane dental impression material. They would take dental impressions, release the monkeys, uh, they'd go back up into the tree, they'd come back the next year, take follow-up dental impressions, they'd release them, they'd go back the next year, uh, on and on and on, and they just kept doing this over time, and built up this wonderful data set of teeth of wild monkeys and how they changed in their shapes over time. I took these and did dental topographic analysis on them. 
and found that if you look at the change of slope over years of the surface, there is a progressive increase in change of slope with more and more years between observation. Again, teeth are getting flatter as they wear down for this species. And it's the same for relief. But interestingly for angularity or jaggedness of the surface of the tooth, that remains incredibly uniform. There is no significant change over time in the angularity or jaggedness of the tooth with wear. So this may actually be a characteristic of the shape of a tooth that remains consistent for processing specific kinds of foods throughout the life of the species. To me, this was pretty exciting. Well, let's fast forward until 2018 when I did my last dental topography study. My students and I looked at about 350 individuals representing a dozen species of monkeys, all from the same area, Para State in Brazil, along the same stretch of river. The monkeys included fruit-eating monkeys like the squirrel monkey. It included marmosets that gouge and eat saps and gums, howling monkeys that prefer to eat leaves, and capuchin monkeys that more often eat hard foods, hard objects. What happens when we plot them out? Well, when we plot them out by primary diet, and this graph shows you that orientation patch count and angularity, both of which seem to be very uh, resistant to change with wear. And we actually find that there is a nice relationship, or separation at least, by diet in some cases. Leaf eaters are clearly separated from gum feeders, and those two are separated from seed predators. I will say that fruit eaters kind of span the spectrum. On the other hand, if you just isolate the fruit eaters, it turns out that secondary diet, that is the foods that these animals eat when they can't get their preferred foods, separate out fruit eaters, such that those that supplement their diets with hard objects are clearly separated from insect eaters, clearly separated from leaf eaters, and clearly separated from seed predators. So it's pretty clear that based on primary or secondary diets, primates that eat different foods can be distinguished on the basis of the topography of their molar surfaces. Awesome. But is it really that simple? Maybe not. Anybody who studies relationships between anatomy and behavior know that it can be really complex. All you have to do is look at those goats that climb trees in Morocco. And they depend on the situation. In fact, biological structures are often overbuilt for day-to-day -day functioning. An example that I like to give is this one here. You may drive a car that's capable of going 100 miles an hour, but you're not gonna be driving that way during rush hour, which is what you're gonna be driving uh, during most of the time. But that power can be really helpful. Those few times you've gotta to accelerate to get on the highway. If, we're, if we extrapolate this to teeth, Let's say that you have to eat rocks five days a year, or you're just going to die at the end of the year. You'll starve to death. Doesn't matter what you eat those other 360 days. If you eat jello those 360 days, your teeth had still better be designed for eating rocks, or you're not going to make it. So it turns out that structures, as I said, are often overbuilt for day to day functioning. They tend to follow the most challenging of the needs that they have. But you know what? That's great talk. Let's go into the forest, watch some animals eat, and see what actually happens. The default model is one called species-specific dietary adaptations. And this was developed by uh, an anthropologist uh, back in the, in the 1980s named uh, Bob Sussman. And he argued that primates will eat specific food types even when they live in different habitats because the shapes of their teeth and the anatomy of their guts tell them that that's what they should be eating. So whether you're looking, for example, at ring-tailed lemurs on Madagascar, howling monkeys in South America, or vervets in Africa, those living in different conditions, more open versus more closed, for example, will seek out similar foods, regardless of where they live, even if the same exact species of foods aren't available to them in different places. That's because, you know, if you're Shapes of your teeth tell you to eat something, you're gonna look for foods like that. 
But you know what? It's not always that simple. I'll give you an example from some of my own early research at a site called Kitambe in Sumatra, in the Gunung Lusur National Park in the northern part of the island. There are seven species of primates at Kitambe, and they all have access to the same types of foods. They all live in the same patch of forest, but the sizes and shapes of their teeth and their jaws are quite different from one another. So it's a wonderful natural experiment to see whether their differences in diet can be explained by the differences in tooth shape and jaw shape and size. And in fact, they do eat some of the same foods. My favorite example is a, a fruit called Netamlatifolium. This is, has the unusual property of getting harder as it ripens. The fruit is on a liana or a vine, and it's about the size of well, somewhere between a golf ball and a tennis ball. And what's interesting is, as I said, all the primates eat Netamlatifolium fruits, but the macaques, the leaf monkeys, and the gibbons will go up to these fruits, and as they get too hard, they'll try to bite into them, won't be able to, and will drop them. You can actually see the tooth impressions on the outside of the fruit. Well, it turns out that Orangutans will eat these fruits for up to weeks after the macaques, leaf monkeys, and gibbons have been forced to abandon them because these great apes, the orangutans, have much stronger, thicker teeth and more powerful jaws. So in this case, we've got species with very different jaws and teeth, but an incredible overlap in diet, even to the same species of fruits. The differences are subtle, but they are due to adaptive morphology. Another example, the mountain gorilla. For those of you who are used to looking at people's mouths, you know that these look absolutely bizarre. Look how sharp and crusty these molar teeth are. They are well suited for shearing and slicing tough foods like leaves and stems and wild celery. Well, it turns out that mountain gorillas that live at fairly low altitudes actually prefer and consume soft fruit most of the year. That's what any self-respecting great ape would eat. We are essentially fruit eaters, but their anatomy allows them to eat tough leaves and stems during periods of seasonal stress, a couple months out of the year, when their favorite foods are simply unavailable. It gives them an advantage. Now let's compare these mountain gorillas to ones that live at higher altitudes. We can call them perpetual fallback feeders. I'm not sure my primatology friends would like the term, but since I'm giving this webinar, so be it. <laughs> Perpetual fallback feeders, uh, in this case, would be higher altitude gorillas that have been forced into upper elevation ranges by human encroachment. They live in what are called the Virunga Mountains, which are these high volcanic peaks. And the land around these volcanoes is incredibly rich agricultural lands, and it supports the highest density of people outside of urban areas on the African continent. And as a result, people have kind of pushed these poor gorillas up to these high altitude areas where there simply are no soft fleshy fruits. They eat lower quality tough foods all of the time. They're able to because again, their anatomy allows it, not because it's what they want to eat. So example number two, same species, same adaptive specializations, but different diets because they live in different environments. Example number three, hard object feeding mangabees. These are monkeys with thick, flat teeth and strong jaws, clearly well designed for crushing hard foods. There are a couple of species I'll talk about. The first are called sooty mangabees that live alongside a dozen other species in the Thai forest of the Ivory Coast. And they prefer to eat the nuts of fruits called sacaglottis fruits. These nuts are extremely hard. They're like uh, peach pits, right? They're, they're rot resistant and are available year round on the forest floor. Best of all, no one else can eat them because their teeth just aren't capable of breaking them. Only these manga bees can break into them. And they eat them all year. They prefer them, in fact. Compare that to another species of manga bees with very similar teeth. 
Great cheek manga bees actually, on the other hand, prefer soft fleshy fruits available most of the time where they live at the site of Kabali in Uganda. And decades of study have shown that these monkeys only eat hard foods during periods of extreme drought when their preferred fruits aren't available. And these extreme drought periods come with strong El Nino events, maybe once or twice in a generation. So most of the time, these manga bees eat the same fruits as their wimpier toothed cousins that live alongside them, but they have an advantage when they need it. So these monkeys are closely related, have similar teeth and jaws, live in similar environments, but have very different food preferences. All right, so life is complicated when it comes to relationships between tooth form and function. And this brings up the concept of what I like to call the biospheric buffet, right? The basic idea is that teeth limit what can be eaten, but food choice is really determined in large part by availability in a given habitat. I think of the biosphere, that part of our planet that harbors life is kind of a giant buffet table, right? I envision animals bellying up to the sneeze guard with their plates in their hands and they're picking and choosing from whatever foods are put out there at a given time, in a given place, and the choices they make define them as species. Do teeth matter? Of course they do. They're the basic utensils that these animals have to eat with, but there's so much more to determining what goes into food choice. This is why, for example, chimpanzees eat forest fruits and young leaves, and Gelata baboons consume grass and open savannas. Yeah, their teeth make a difference, but food choice is about what you've got access to. You know what, if that's true, how can we relate teeth and diet? Well, an approach that I've been working on for my whole career is something I call food prints. Food prints can be thought of in the same way as footprints left in the sand. They're traces of activities of once living organisms. Not evidence of what somebody evolved to eat, but actual evidence left behind by food of what was eaten. There are lots of different kinds of food prints. Some look at the chemistry of teeth. Some look for little bits and pieces of food trapped within tartar that's preserved over thousands or millions of years. But I like to look at something called dental microware which are the microscopic scratches and pits that form on a tooth's surface as the result of its use. The basic idea is that when we think of the role of teeth as guides for chewing, they chew in different ways based on the foods that are being eaten. So for example, if you're crushing foods between opposing cusps, you may create pitting. That's the basic idea. And this is the kind of pattern we see for a hard object feeder. If you are, on the other hand, shearing or slicing through tough foods, perhaps the abrasives on or in those foods get dragged along the surface during tooth movements, creating long parallel scratches. The traditional way of looking at scratches and pits is something called microware feature analysis. You take a scanning electron microscope, you stick a tooth under it, and you basically go in and you count and measure every single scratch and every single pit on the surface of that tooth, up to hundreds of them. This seems tedious, but you know what? It actually works. This is some data from a colleague of mine, Mark Tiefer, looking at ratios of pits to scratches for different species of primates. Up here at the top, we've got 60% pits and 40% scratches. Down here, 10% pits and 90% scratches. Each of these bars represents a different species. In green, tough leaf eater. In brown or, or gold, depending upon your screen, hard object specialist. And in red, we have soft fruit eater. And as you can see, there actually is a decent separation just in the way you would predict on the basis of diet. But just as conventional shearing crest analyses have their limits, so too does conventional microware analysis. For example, when you take an SEM image, the surface that you see is going to depend in part on how you've set your instrument because you've got what's called the 3D to 2D problem. 
When you take a three-dimensional surface and image it in two dimensions, using shadowing as your measure of relief, you're gonna get a different picture depending upon the relative um, positioning of the electron beam, the specimen, and the collector, just as your view of the Grand Canyon would be different if you looked at it from one vantage point at sunrise, midday, and sunset. So depending, watch, watch what happens as I rotate the specimen uh, in the SEM. You go from a heavily scratched surface to a heavily pitted surface, back to a heavily scratched surface. So instrument settings could affect the result in the image. We try to be consistent, but you're always going to have noise in your measurements because of that. Needless to say, you're also going to have noise in your measurements because if you measure all of these scratches and pits by hand, up to hundreds of them, there's no way you can get exactly the same measurements twice. And two observers will usually get very different measurements. And so uh, this measurement error is going to introduce more noise. And it's in fact amazing that microware has been able to pick out diet at all, given the signal to noise ratio issues. So I set out to tackle these problems, the 3D to 2D problem and the observer measurement error problem, and develop something called microware texture analysis. It starts with a confocal profiler. I've got a couple in my lab. This one is called Wally, as you can probably tell by those googly eyes we stuck on it. Uh, and that's basically used to uh, generate a 3D rendering of the surface at high magnification. This is about a tenth of a millimeter wide. And we expose this surface to conventional engineering-based scale-sensitive fractal analysis. That's a, a standard for measuring surface texture. So scale-sensitive fractal analysis is really interesting. Uh, it's based on the idea that surface texture depends on your scale of observation. If, for example, you're driving along a country road, for you in the car, it may seem smooth, but to an ant crossing that road, it can seem very rough. So surface texture changes with your scale of observation. And it's that change that defines complexity. So if, for example, you've got a low scale of observation, large area, you get a low roughness. As your observation scale gets smaller and smaller, or finer and finer, I should say, your roughness increases. Even finer, your roughness increases more. So that when you plot your scale of observation over the roughness or relative area, you get the steepest part of the slope being how we define complexity. So a surface dominated by pits of various shapes and sizes will be complex, whereas one dominated by linear scratches all about the same size and shape will be much simpler. There are lots of other texture attributes we can look at. Here's one, anisotropy or directionality of the surface. And without going into detail on how we measure it, the surface at the top here, with lots of scratches running in the same orientation, is much uh, more anisotropic than the one below that has more uniform directionality to it. So basically then, we can think of this leaf feeder as having simple anisotropic surfaces, and this hard object feeder as having complex isotropic surfaces. And this holds whether we look at new world monkeys like howling monkeys or capuchin, or we look at old world higher primates like this grass-eating gelata and this hard object specialist manga bee from the Thai forest. It even holds when we look at other mammals. Here is a tough meat-eating cheetah versus a brown crunching hyena. Here's a tough bamboo-feeding panda versus a more omnivorous black bear. For that matter, uh, a kangaroo that eats mostly grasses compared to a more browse, broad-dieted, browse-consuming wallaby. It even holds for things that don't have tooth enamel, like this sloth that eats mostly leaves versus this more omnivorous armadillo. Com texture complexity and anisotropy usually separate closely related mammals by their diets. My favorite example, though, are the antelopes. Here's uh, from a study by one of my former grad students, Jessica Scott. I plotted anisotropy, directionality, versus complexity. And antelopes are awesome because they run the spectrum from those that eat nothing but grass to those that eat nothing but tree products like fruits. 
and everything in between. A little bit of browse, a little bit of tree, and a lot of grass, to a lot of tree and a little grass. Uh, and when we plot these out, they show a beautiful, beautiful spectrum. And what's nice about this is not just that you can tell the diets of antelopes, but there's a lot of fossil antelopes found at the sites that human ancestors are recovered. You can look at those and say, for example, if most of your fossil antelopes come out as grazers, that those human ancestors probably lived in the open savanna because that's where the grass was. If most come out as browsers, those ancestors probably still lived in forests because that's the food that the antelopes who lived there ate. So this is very useful for a variety of purposes. But let's get back to, uh, for a minute, to primates and diets. Our hypothesis would be that if we have a whole bunch of tough food specialist fossils and they all come out looking simple in terms of the microware, I should say a bunch of fossils and they all come out simple, that our hypothesis is that they're tough food specialists. If they all come out looking complex, our hypothesis is that they were hard food specialists. And if many of them are simple, but there are a few out towards the complex end of the spectrum, they may have been hard object fallback feeders, like our manga bees from Kabali in Uganda. And in fact, for many species, this is kind of what we find. Here we've got a leaf eating, primate species, a langur, and it has low microware texture complexity as compared to a hard object specialist, manga bee, which has much higher texture complexity, and a soft fruit eating macaque monkey, which is intermediate between, on average, this leaf eater and this hard object feeder. What's most interesting though, is when you look at the hard object fallback feeder, the one that most of the time eats soft fruits, its distribution looks very much like the soft fruit eater. But as expected, there are a few points out towards the extreme, a few outliers consistent with the consumption of hard foods on occasion. So in principle, we can use microware to separate animals that have similar shaped teeth, but who have different diets. So with my remaining time, let's talk a little bit about our own ancestors and what we can learn about their diets from their teeth. We have to take just a minute to review the human family tree. The human family tree is represented by species spanning about 7 million years. There are thousands of fossils in the human fossil record at this point. My own uh, mentor, his advisor, my grand professor, I guess, Philip Tobias, used to refer to this as an embarrassment of riches. And we can divide this up into four basic groups. The first group we can call Ardipithecus and friends. And these aren't necessarily human ancestors. There's some debate as to whether they're actually on our side of the split between chimps and humans, at least all of them. But you know what? They are wonderful models for what the common ancestor would have looked like. And they actually still lived in the trees of what was then the woodlands of Eastern Africa and the Sahel of Chad. Then by about four to two million years ago, we have a split in the evolutionary tree. Uh, not yet, actually. We have a group called Australopithecus, uh, and they began to come down out of the trees, at least on occasion, as the savannas began to spread across Africa. After that, we get a split in the evolutionary tree, 2.5 or 2.8 million years ago. In one direction, we get this highly specialized group called Paranthropus, which has big flat teeth and very heavy skulls and, and muscle crests suggesting massive chewing muscles. And in the other direction, our own ancestors, the biological genus Homo. Teeth get large, uh, smaller, the brains get larger, they come down out of the trees, they leave the African continent, and we are the end result, at least at this point. What do the teeth have to tell us? Well, traditionally, Ardipithecus has been viewed sort of as a generic fruit-eating woodland form with modest sized molars, with modestly thin enamel, and modest amount of relief, pretty much what you'd expect of a generic fruit eater. But when we get to Australopithecus and particularly Paranthropus, we see bigger, flatter teeth, more thick enamel on those teeth. 
When we get to the, uh, then it looks like they're becoming more specialized. But when we get to our own ancestors, the biological genus Homo, we see a reversal of trend. The teeth get smaller, the enamel gets thinner, the crests get higher. So this has led to essentially a model where we start with a soft, pliant fruit eater, six, seven million years ago, and we get what almost looks like progressive. We don't like to use the word progressive in evolution, but we get a, a pattern of increasing specialization from early to late Australopithecus and then into Paranthropus for hard, perhaps abrasive savanna foods. Whereas in our, our own ancestors, we get a reversal. We get a broader diet. The teeth get smaller and thinner. The crests get higher. We start to see tools and cut marks on bones suggesting meat consumption. And that's our basic model. All right, what, are the, uh, what does dental topography have to teach us about this? Remember I said that we could take the data from living animals and just put fossils onto the map? Let's do that. So we have here gorillas, and this is a occlusal slope, unworn, modestly worn, heavily worn. Gorillas and their occlusal slope, chimps and their occlusal slope, and Australopithecus has flatter teeth than even chimpanzees, suggesting more of an ability to consume hard foods and less tough ones than even chimps. Paranthropus looks even more specialized, harder foods, fewer tough ones. But early Homo comes out between chimps and gorillas in terms of its occlusal slope, suggesting perhaps a better ability to consume tough foods than chimps, but better for hard foods than gorillas. So this more or less actually confirms the traditional model. But is it really that simple? Remember the biospheric buffet. Remember that foods are determined in part by what's available to you. And sometimes it's not that simple. Here are microware textures of Australopithecus species, Paranthropus species, and Homo species. And because we're short on time, I'm just going to um, give you very briefly uh, one attribute, microware texture complexity. Microware texture complexity, again, low values, soft foods, perhaps tough, high values, hard foods, perhaps brittle. In red, we've got Australopithecus, blue Paranthropus, green Homo. So when we break this down, we look at Australopithecus, there's not a lot of evidence for hard object consumption. The earlier afarensis may consume slightly less hard foods on average than the slightly later, later Australopithecus africanus, but not, not much to speak about. When we look at Paranthropus though, it's really interesting. Two species, the top one from South Africa, the bottom one from East Africa. The East African form looks just like their Australopithecus predecessors with a soft food diet, but the South African form shows a really broad spectrum of foods, at least judging from the microware texture complexity, including a lot of hard foods, which is consistent with the shapes of their teeth. When we move on to Homo, we get another interesting pattern. The earliest species, Habilis, looks kind of like um, Australopithecus, but a little bit broader spectrum in its diet. And the later ones, Erectus, Neanderthals, and the Lady, have an even broader base diet on the basis of microware texture complexity. So breaking this down for Homo species, it looks like we see a pattern from early to late Australopithecus, then early to late Homo, of increasingly broad diets based on the microware. Whereas in Paranthropus, we see the same pattern in one case, but in the other case, a much narrower diet in the South Af or the East African form. And this is basically kind of like what we saw with our mangabees, right? If this holds, this suggests that one form had a much broader diet and another had a much narrower diet, even though the sizes and shapes of the teeth, the muscle patterns for chew the chewing muscles, the thickness of the skull are the same. All right. So how do we explain this? Let's go back briefly to the biospheric buffet. Remember, food choice is about availability. Fortunately, we know something about the availability of foods over the course of human evolution in Africa. Paleoclimate researchers have spent an awful lot of time and energy and money reconstructing the environments in the past over the course of human evolution in Africa. And this is kind of what we see 
a swing back and forth between cooler and drier and warmer and wetter conditions. In fact, there is an average trend towards cooling and drying throughout human evolution, which makes sense because the savannas have spread across Africa and replaced the forests. On the other hand, there's another trend for increasing amplitude of these swings. The swings get much wider over time as conditions change much more radically. In the biospheric buffet table, more and more dishes are changed more and more rapidly. This, many of us have argued, explains why our own ancestors, Homo, had such a variable diet, because this, these dramatic swings in climate selected for dietary versatility. Right, well, that's about all we know about the evolution of human diet from teeth. Can we use this today in any way? Well, these books, the paleo diet books, have sold literally millions and millions of copies, right? A lot of people are still going paleo today. They're based on the fundamental premise that we're not eating what our ancestors evolved to eat. And that's causing all kinds of health problems. So whether, uh, let's say you put diesel in a car built for regular gasoline. It's not going to be good. And whether you're filling your face or your car, the wrong fuel is going to wreak havoc on the system. And in our case, paleo diet girls teach us that many of the chronic degenerative diseases that we face today, heart disease, several forms of cancer, type 2 diabetes, can be linked to a mismatch between the diets we evolved to eat and what we eat today. According to these diet gurus, cereal grains, dairy, processed and refined foods are out. We should be getting our uh, carbohydrates from non-starchy fruits and vegetables. We should get, be getting our, our protein from grass-fed cows and fish. I have to say I'm not a dietitian and I can't speak with any authority about the nutritional costs and benefits of either of these diet types, but I can speak to their evolutionary underpinnings. When we look at the early human diet, and I'm often asked what the ancestral human diet was, I always say to myself, what ancestor, right? Our lineage has been a work in progress for millions of years. And the different species ate different foods. Not only that, but remember the biospheric buffet? In different places, a given ancestor probably ate different foods. The ones that lived in the open savanna surely had a different diet than those that lived by the lakeshore or in the forest. Perhaps, in fact, this explains the success of our species. Why people have been able to find something to eat on all of this planet's myriad biospheric buffets, whether it's nothing but marine mammals and fish in the high Arctic on the north shore of Alaska, or 70% sugary melons and starchy roots on the equator in Africa. I think that the real answer to this paleo diet question is that if anything, we evolved for a versatile diet that's allowed us to take advantage of the world in all of the myriad biospheric buffets, and that's given us the success largely that we've had. And if our teeth have anything to say about it, it's that they have evolved to allow us to do just that. So thank you to the humble human molar tooth. And that's it. Thank you very much. All righty. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Unger. Uh, we have uh, we have almost uh, 20 questions here, and I'll try not to be redundant. Uh, I've gone through a few of them, but uh, let's start with our first question. Uh, do you have any studies measuring the enamel dentin pulp ratio, something more about composition rather than anatomical? Composition. Um, you mean degree of mineralization? I'm not quite sure what comp composition means there, so. Uh, well, the different human ancestor species have different ratios of enamel to dentin, which translates basically to different thicknesses in different parts of the tooth. Um, that's certainly true. And also, there are also differences in the way that the prisms in the enamel are laid out relative to the surface. Um, the orientation of prisms relative to the surface 
dictates the strength and resilience of that enamel to a degree. Um, and the orientation actually of the uh, dentin tubules and the, the interdentin, intertubular dentin uh, also uh, speaks to the resiliency and uh, flexibility of the dentin. And so when you combine these things, you can actually evolve teeth that wear in specific ways that maintain their functional efficiency. You can add to the strength of the teeth and so forth. There are certainly differences in degree of mineralization of enamel and dentin in different parts of the crown as well. Okay. And pulp chamber, of course, varies with age as it fills in. Can you briefly elaborate the difference between angularity and relief? Sure. Angularity is jaggedness. Relief, uh, you can think of, um, you can think of a, of a, of a stairs as having high angularity because it's the change in the slope. You can think of a, a basic um, board that lays over those stairs but is flat as having the same average slope, but those stairs themselves, which change their slope, will be more angular. So to translate this to teeth, if, for example, you're looking at an animal that has high crown relief and the dentin is penetrated in some areas to the point where it leaves a, a pit on the occlusal surface, that's gonna generate higher angularity. Whereas the actual slope of the surface may be the same as if that pit didn't exist. Okay, when looking at those pits, uh, would you define that uh, as erosion or corrosion in that case? Well, I mean, there's attrition, there's abrasion, and there's erosion, right? Um, and the way anthropologists define these may well be different from the way that clinicians do. Anthropologists uh, define erosion as chemical action, uh, abrasion as tooth tooth wear, and attrition as food tooth wear. I'm not sure whether you guys do it the same way or not. Uh, there's a, a debate on the term erosion and corrosion, so that's why okay. I threw that we out. We tend there. not to use corrosion okay. in anthropology. Um, is there any data regarding prosthetics and tooth selection, i.e. for dentures in uh, our adult patients or any patients? So I guess the question there is, uh, what kind of, uh, on molars, what kind of tooth form as an anthropologist would you select, say, for a 70-year-old patient? Uh, well, if there's, a, if there's an opposing tooth... <laughs> <laughs> one that matches it. Um, I, I guess the one thing that I would say is that um, my dentist, not my current dentist, some of my old dentists, were very concerned about tooth wear and how we should try to avoid it. In fact, I work with a group of hunter-gatherers called the Hadzabe uh, in, um, in Africa. They're the last remaining hunter-gatherers. And almost all of them, by the time their third molars come in, the first molars are nothing but rims of enamel around the outer edge with massive islands of dentin between them, secondary and tertiary dentin that have filled in to make up the difference. Um, tooth wear is absolutely normal. In those cases, the surfaces are just basically flat opposing planes. Okay, and how would you, you know how we describe occlusion in dentistry, class one, class two, class three. What is the occlusion of this tribe? It's tip to tip. Okay. So um, none of the above. <laughs> okay. the, front teeth, the front teeth come into tip to tip contact, contact. And that's true across the board, whether you're looking at traditional Australian Aboriginals or Inuit from Alaska, or these peoples, the Hadzabe from Africa. It's, it's always the anterior teeth are tip to tip. There's never any anterior dental crowding, no, no, um, no, no tooth crowding or, or, or curvature. Um, there's never impacted wisdom teeth. They, they're, they're in beautifully and in occlusion. There's usually a retromolar gap behind the third molar tooth. Um, it's a very different looking into the mouth of a traditional person than your average American dental patient. 
Um, along uh, those lines, uh, primates, do primates uh, uh, get uh, dental abscesses? Very, very rarely. We occasionally see caries, for example, uh, in um, some fruit-eating monkeys, but by and large, non-human primates tend not to have dental disease. Um, and, and presumably this is because of the refined sugars that we, that we consume and they don't. And, and its impact on this, um, on, the, on, the, on the bacterial balance, as it were, the caries balance between, between things like lactobacillus and streptococcus mutans on the one hand and the beneficial bacteria uh, at least for the mouth, that, that are fighting them. Okay. Here's, uh, could it be that diet shapes the morphology of teeth rather than the other way around? This is, this, uh, if this is what I think it is, it's the chicken and egg question. <laughs> uh, the question is, do we evolve teeth and then seek out food, foods that they're well suited to breaking down? Or do we find foods and then um, evolve teeth that are best suited to them? The reality is, this is a hard question to answer because there's probably a feedback loop, right? Uh, if you have foods available to you and you happen to have teeth that are well suited to one kind of food, those individuals that have teeth better suited to that food are going to be selected for, and the teeth are going to, within the population, slowly but surely evolve in that direction as the ones that have the, the teeth better suited to that particular food out reproduce those that don't. Do primates exhibit bruxism? Ah, I don't know. <laughs> How's that for an answer? Okay, that's a, that's a good answer. <laughs> I can make something up. I would yeah. guess not, but I have no idea. Okay, briefly, uh, the, how do the TMJ structures of other primates compare to human beings? Temporomandibular joint structure is very variable within the primates. Not so much within primate species, but some primates have a much more, much more restricted movement at the TMJ. Uh, humans have, are fairly flexible at the TMJ, but not as flexible as some like human ancestors, which have completely flat uh, glenoid surfaces. So it, it varies dramatically by species. Okay, uh, this is a sleep apnea question, so we'll see how you do with it. How do you explain your food print theory versus parafunctional wear as a result of alterations in sleep patterns and or sleep disordered breathing, uh, upper airway resistance syndrome, sleep apnea? <laughs> well, this is a huge research area, uh, particularly for uh, sleep dentists and um, orthotropic specialists that, that focus on jaw length and constriction of the airways. There's very little doubt that our ancestors and living people today with a traditional diet and most non-human animals, I mean dogs, domesticated animals will often have uh, teeth that are, that are crooked and crowded. Um, they all have longer jaws, and longer jaws mean more room in the tongue for uh, breathing, uh, or more room in the mouth for breathing, more room in the mouth for the tongue. So there's this speculation that, and it's probably true, that our ancestors didn't suffer from sleep apnea the way we do because their jaws were longer. And our shortened jaws are a direct result of the fact that we're not loading those jaws uh, as much in childhood as our ancestors did. And when you load, and, and, and the osteoblasts in your jaw respond to the loads that, that are acting on them. So uh, if, if you're feeding your toddler mashed peas, they're probably not getting the kind of strain on that mandible that it needs to grow to its optimal length to fit the teeth. Mm. And if it doesn't fit the teeth, then it doesn't fit the uh, the, the tongue, and it's not going to be sufficient for the airway. There are lots of people that specialize in this. I don't, but I do have a, a general understanding of how jaw length has changed. Okay. Uh, do variations of teeth morphology affect jawbone density and size? 
Whoa, really good question. Did variation in tooth morphology affect jaw bone density and size? I can give you an example of something really an interesting phenomenon. There's been a general theory forever that leaf eating animals, animals that eat lots of tough foods need to have larger molar teeth to process more food in a given time because each bite, each volume of food uh, gives you fewer calories. And so the basic idea is that leaf eating primates should have larger platforms than fruit eating primates because they need to process more food in a given bite. Um, that holds for apes and it holds for new world monkeys, but not old world monkeys. And nobody could figure out why. It didn't make any sense until a, uh, a researcher actually started to look at jaw length. And what he found was that leaf eating primates tend to have, at least old world monkeys, tend to have shorter jaws than fruit eaters. And they've got shorter jaws because that improves the, uh, the, the, the vector of force between opposing teeth and makes for more efficient chewing for repetitive loading. Shorter jaw, more efficient. Longer jaw, less so. And so he argued that a reduced jaw length for efficient chewing actually selected for smaller molar teeth, which is counterintuitive if you think of platform size. But if their teeth remain the same size, they would have suffered from the same kinds of malocclusion issues and dental crowding that we do today. This is an interesting one. Uh, what are your thoughts on people trying to feed their pet dog or cat a vegetarian diet? <laughs> um, please don't do that. <laughs> Um, the dog and cat aren't going to be happy, especially the cat. I mean, dogs are great because they can eat just about anything, right? They're, they're truly omnivorous, and they have a broad potential diet. Cats, not so much. I mean, they evolve to eat meat. They, they get, they're basically designed to do what's called gluconeogenesis. They're designed to, to get their carbohydrates from meat and basically take proteins and turn them into, into meat. Um, amino acids and turn them into, into meat. So I wouldn't be a huge fan of it. Um, you know, uh, this all goes back to that, to that old debate. You, you know Pythagoras, right, from the middle school triangle fame? He's actually the patron saint of ethical vegetarianism. He once wrote how, how, uh, how wrong it is for animal, animals to be made of animal flesh. And so he was a, basically, as I said, the people at PETA cite him all the time. Um, on the other hand, are you going to blame an, uh, a lion for taking a gazelle? No, that's what they evolved to eat. That's what they're designed to eat. There's no, um, th there's no morality issue here to, to fight with. And I would say that's the same for cats. Right. But that's just me. <laughs> you want to feed, you feed your cat, vegetarian cat food, knock yourself out. Yeah. They're not designed for it. Their guts aren't and their teeth aren't. All right. Is there a classification of tooth wear that is applied in pre-industrial skulls? A classic, I'm sorry? Is there a classification of tooth wear that is applied in pre-industrial skulls? A classic occasion? A classification of the oh, wear. classification of tooth wear. Sorry. Um, yeah, there are in fact several different types of wear scores. Um, actually, the director of the National Center of Science Education, or the former one, Jeannie Scott, developed what's called Scott scoring. And you can Google it uh, on Google Scholar. And you can find that there is a standard uh, type of classification that involves measuring the, the amount of facetting on the tooth, measuring the amount of dentin exposure on the tooth. And we all use a variant of that uh, when we classify teeth in terms of their degree of wear. Okay. Scott scores. Scott scores, okay. Uh, have you looked at micro wear texture differences between different cultures and their diets in modern humans and drawn any conclusions? Huh. Uh, that's been done to a limited degree, not by me but some colleagues, for example, in Japan. 
uh, compared traditional Japanese fisher people to Japanese, um, urban Japanese, and found some differences in microware textures that seemed to make some sense. Lots of work done by what are called bioarchaeologists who work on more traditional societies comparing hunter-gatherers with early agriculturalists, and they see dramatic differences as well. Um, so there has been some work done. It's not work that I've done, uh, but it has been used to reconstruct uh, things about, for example, the transition to agriculture. And when people started to apply uh, pottery in cooking uh, and softening of stews and things of that nature, people have used it to, to reconstruct um, to, to, to relate the use of hammers and, or, or uh, mortars and pestles in processing grains like corn and so forth. So there has been a good deal of work done in this area. Okay, so along those lines of softening food, so would you say that agriculture increased carb intake had a greater effect on the, our dentition than the discovery of fire making food softer? I think both of them had dramatic impacts. And I think the earliest stone tools, uh, where we were able to more precisely cut tough foods had a dramatic impact. I think it was an iterative process. I think it was step by step by step. And in fact, there are many agriculturalists that actually have fairly me mechanically challenging diets, right? Um, if you look at rural Kentuckians, Rob Corcini did a study, um, or people living in uh, rural settings in India that have traditional agricultural diets. Their food, their, their, their lentils even, things like that, can be still fairly tough, and their teeth look quite different from those of their children and their grandchildren who now shop in supermarkets and eat processed and refined foods out of cans. All righty, here's a question from our friend, Dr. Robley. It seems that teeth are natural stress breakers through wear. What do you think about dentists replacing natural tooth structure with unbreakable materials that do not wear? Uh, so this is a dental materials question. Uh, for instance, uh, the, uh, material called zirconia that we use. So yeah, yeah. well, this is, uh, Rick, this is not my area of specialty. Uh, but I do remember at one point um, listening to a, a presentation at the Northwest Arkansas Dental Society meetings where uh, I was taught that you've got to be really careful of the material that you use, especially if, um, if opposing crowns are made out of different material. So if, for example, you are chewing on a natural tooth on the upper and a, a hardened uh, a hardened material that's not at all resilient, um, or at least not at all flexible, um, elastic on, on the bottom, if, if there are differences in the elasticity, something's going to break, and it's going to be probably the natural too. But again, please don't take my word for it. I am, this is not my area of research. Okay. Uh, do you see maxillary exostasis or mandibular torre and monkey? Um, well, you'll have to use a different term than exos. <laughs> uh, exos I, I'm sorry, I'm tongue tied on that one. Exostosis, uh, exostosis, uh, you, you know, enlarged bone. Uh, oh, yeah, got buckle, it. Yeah, or got you, it. And humans will get a, a tori on the, or torus on the roof of our mouth and tori on the mandibular. Yep. Different species of primates have different torus development. Uh, in fact, we are the only primates that have an external torus on our mandible, our external chin. The, the torus is actually internal. It's called the simian shelf in non-human primates. Some have just an inferior one. Others have an inferior and a superior one with a deep pit, genioglossal pit, in between the two. Um, and so they actually have exactly the same amount of resistance, well, roughly the same, resistance to wishboning that we do, only our torus is external and theirs is internal. So as far as relative development of tori goes, I'm not certain, but I can tell you that different species of primates have different kinds of, on average, torus development. 
some internal, some external in our case, and some just an inferior torus, which is a simian shelf, and some both inferior and superior. And they're internal to the mandible. Okay, and do you see uh, larger tori in animals with a harder diet? You know, I'm not certain. I don't wanna, I don't wanna make that claim uh, because I'm not sure. I do know that the relationship between mandibular morphology and diet is a complicated one. And it's, it's something that people have been trying to understand for a really long time, in part because it's sometimes not so easy to tell the difference between animals that have uh, buttressing to resist occasional really high magnitude loads, hard object feeders, or repetitive low magnitude loads. So it's, it, it can in part be an issue of aggregate stress. If you load your jaw a lot, thousands or tens of thousands of times per day um, at lower magnitudes, you might have the same aggregate stress as an animal that only occasionally will eat very, very hard foods. And that could manifest itself in similar ways. But this is a, a really rich area of research today for non-human primates. Okay. Are human teeth getting smaller with evolution? <laughs> Um, there is some evidence that human teeth have decreased in size through human evolution. And absolutely, as we go from early Homo to Homo erectus to Homo sapiens, the teeth get progressively smaller. There's even some evidence, if you look at prehistoric Nubians, for example, versus those today, the teeth have evolved to become slightly smaller, which has been argued as an evolutionary step towards... Um, Towards, towards being able to navigate and negotiate these shorter jaws, but not in a dramatic fashion. And there's a lot of variation in tooth size among populations. Uh, Australian Aboriginals and Native Americans, for example, today have much larger teeth on average than Europeans. Okay. Do you think posture and cranial-based development has an effect on the jaw development, or is it mostly diet? <laughs> there are a lot of people working on this very question right now. It seems that the strains um, involve both, right? The bit, you don't chew on the base of your skull, but it does seem that chewing strains and stresses um, certainly impact it. I don't know if that's answering your question, um, but I think, I think the jury's still out as to what the impacts are. Okay, this one is obviously from a dentist that has seen your uh, presentation before and uh, asks, uh, how does your scanner accuracy compare to polyvinyl siloxane in the analysis of micro wear and pitting? This is really interesting because uh, there was a study done two years ago in the, in the journal, um, what was it called? In, in one of the uh, scientific reports where they compared different brands of polyvinyl siloxane dental impression material, light body to regular body to heavy body. And it turns out that both the brand and the viscosity of the dental impression material make a huge difference in the fidelity and the, the, uh, the repeatability and the accuracy and the precision of the impressions in terms of microscopic scale. Um, I'm, not going to, um, I'm not going to advertise for any one brand because that would be inappropriate in this context, but look at the literature. If you look at scientific reports, you can see which is best. Uh, in this case, the impression material that I use and have used for the past couple of decades, the, um, the, the, they, they've changed the name because I think the company wanted to make everybody buy new kinds of impression guns. <laughs> Uh, they've changed the cartridge. They do this regularly so that everybody has to buy new ones. Um, but in any event, the one that I use shows microware features true to about 100 nanometers, about a tenth of a micron. And um, I mean, and if you start to think about it, vinyl is the same stuff that we used to use to press records. And if you can record Mozart's symphony in the little grooves of a record. You can get that much information, you can sure get scratches on teeth. 
All righty. Uh, did our ancestors have the same cervical lesions that modern man has? Or, yeah, you know, yeah. where we're going with this, the non carious dental lesions, abfraction lesions. What's your opinion? Yeah, uh, NCCLs. I have not seen those in fossil human ancestors. And obviously, the jury is still out on their etiology. Um, but I don't think human evolution can help us with that. What's interesting is that we have seen some human ancestors, and I actually wrote a paper in the um, in, in in one of the dental journals uh, on uh, aproximal lesions, um, lesions between the teeth, what what I incorrectly called interproximal lesions, and was called on, um, and uh, it, the International Journal of Dental Research, I think it was. But in any case, we do find these, particularly in early homo. So creatures that we think were probably meat eaters, and there's speculation that this is actually um, evidence of toothpick use, idiopathic toothpick use. Because when you look inside the groove, you actually see parallel lines, suggesting that, that, that you are using some kind of probe to push in and out. And th these are usually found um, on opposing uh, buckle and uh, on the on the basically on the posterior or distal surface of one tooth, say the second bicuspid or P4, and the anterior surface of the next tooth, say the first molar. You often find those with those lines. You don't find NCCLs though in the fossil record. I don't know of any cases. Okay. Can you have occlusal wear without interproximal wear and mesial drift? <laughs> yes. Um, this actually, this question, um, I know where it's coming from. This is a, this is basically a, if I'm not mistaken, a uh, beg question. <laughs> uh, Beg's, beg being the Australian orthodontist that made the argument that interproximal wear and mesial drift uh, explain why our teeth don't fit in our jaws because we don't wear our teeth enough. Um, in fact, oftentimes we get much more wear uh, occlusally than we do interproximally. Yeah, you, you often get facetting between the teeth in human evolution, and that's how we oftentimes will match uh, specimens in the fossil record when teeth come out individually, but clearly there's often much more occlusal surface wear than interproximal wear, and you're not losing, you know, half a centimeter or a centimeter um, mesiodistally. Uh, can you identify our most recent ancestor in which third molars were more useful than they are now? <laughs> yes, pre-industrial modern humans. As I said, the Hadzabe that I work with have third molars in, fully occluding, and the older individuals, uh, at least those that haven't lost their teeth, have them worn down to nubs in some cases. Okay. Um, back to the sleep apnea breathing. Have you done any studies that relate jaw development to habits of breathing? Specifically, do you believe or have research relating to nasal breathing and jaw growth? I do not. Okay. Um, <laughs> Again, there are experts on this area, um, and one thing that you might consider, uh, there's an there's a, a interesting book out there that was published by Stanford University Press called Jaws, and it was written by an evolutionary biologist and an orthodontist, and um, there are lots of good references in there. It was published a couple of years ago. Okay. Uh, I think you kind of answered this question before, but let's hit it again because it, uh, the way it, it, it states it, it's in terms of so-called class one versus class two versus class three uh, malocclusion as defined according to modern uh, dentistry, do we see class one as being normal in pre-agricultural humans or not? Not. <laughs> All right. um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, basically, basically, it's tip to tip. It's the it's the incisal surface of the upper incisors against the incisal surface of the lower incisors. That's and I have seen that in every non-human uh, 
primate that I've ever looked at. I've seen that in every human ancestor I've ever looked at. And I've seen that in every prehistoric uh, anatomically modern human group that I've ever looked at. Okay. With the modern processing of food, are we seeing any reverse trend in the tooth structures or size of skulls? That's a really good question. I don't know the answer to that, but I can answer it by saying that clearly we know that prehistoric humans who had extremely mechanically challenging diets, like the Australian Aboriginals and the and especially the the Inuit, what what have been called probably not not very appropriately Eskimos, um, northern peoples, um, they tend to have uh, extremely robust skulls. And the, the, the bones of the skull, the bones of the jaw, upper and lower, tend to be thicker and larger. And that's, that's been suggested uh, that the explanation for that is, is phenotypic. It's a response to, to chewing. Okay. I'm going to ask you uh, this one question first, because uh, uh, do you know what a neuromuscular bite is, how we adjust occlusion? There's a, a school of thought on relaxing muscles, changing the vertical dimension. Do you have any background in that? I do not. Okay, so uh, I, I will still <laughs> answer with the question. <laughs> Uh, there's, a, there's, there's a certain group that believe a neuromuscular bite is ideal, and mm -hmm. they oftentimes increase the, the thickness, the height of crowns, so it changes. You have a longer crown to root ratio. What are your thoughts of that and the stress on the dentition? I just don't know. Okay, um, fair enough. <laughs> I don't want to make anything up. Yeah. yeah. All righty. Uh, let's see. Uh, I think we're, we're getting pretty well to the end of them here. Uh, let's give you this one. Do different ethnicities of human have different GIS maps of their teeth? Are different human so societies diverging evolutionary-wise concerning teeth, and is it noticeable? Excellent question. The answer to that is unequivocally yes. For those of you who have European and Asian um, dental patients, take a look at the upper central incisors. Look at the lingual surfaces. Asians have uh, a shoveling that most Europeans don't have. Um, and uh, it's that internal surface of the incisors. Also, as I've already mentioned, different populations of humans tend to have different sizes of teeth in general. Some populations have extra cusps called, for example, the Carabelli's cusp. And researchers have used uh, these extra accessory cusps to actually track movements, genetic movements of populations, say, across the New World. Um, and the introduction of the conquistadors into, um, into South and Central America. So people, uh, anthropologists will often use uh, both metric, that is measurement, uh, and non-metric, that is extra cusps, differences among populations that can be related to genetics to trace migration routes and to look for differences among populations. So yeah, there are definitely differences, just as there are differences in skin, tone, hair, texture, uh, no shape, there are differences in teeth. Terrific. Well, I think you, you hit the gist of most of the questions here. Uh, did any of these questions stimulate anything uh, that you want to comment on before we uh, knock off the webinar here today? Um, not so much. I would say that, um, that, that, your, that the dentists in your group are really fortunate to, to be able to to work with these amazing structures. And I gave a talk uh, at the dental school at Stony Brook University just before this uh, COVID-19 hit. And, you know, it was amazing because when these, uh, when these kids, not so much dental students, but the residents uh, in their program, when they started to think about teeth in a manner that was more than just sort of them breaking or fixing them. 
And you start to realize what incredible structures they are and what they can do and how they've evolved and how they've changed over their half billion year history. They become really interesting and exciting things to work on. And, and I hope that if nothing else, um, those uh, who, who came and visited uh, with us today will at least have, have a little bit more of an appreciation for um, what nature can do and, and how we're just one of probably hundreds of thousands of species that have hardened structures in our mouths that, that function in breaking down food. And, and just, I would hope that people would bear that in mind as they move forward. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Unger. It was really a pleasure. It's good to see you again. I uh, look forward to getting out with you to do some photography again one of these days. Uh, I can't compete with your Tanzania photos, but that's okay. Uh, All righty. Uh, thank you for everybody that joined us today. We had uh, around 800 participants, so that's fantastic. I'm just going to finish off here by sharing my screen for those of you that want uh, more information about our upcoming webinar. Again, CE credits, you will see something in your email in the next couple of days. AGD members, we will submit to the AGD. That will be credited automatically, but do not be expecting anything before at least four weeks out, okay? With that, I'd like to thank uh, our panelists. I'd like to thank our executive director, Valerie Bartoli, uh, Dr. Gary Hayamoto, and again, Dr. Unger. And uh, with that, uh, we're uh, wishing everybody uh, to uh, from the WAGD, the stay home, stay healthy CE. Uh, have a good day, a great weekend, and we'll see you on Monday. Thanks, guys. Thank you.